This tutorial seeks to cover the basic principles of managing post-operative pain. We'll look at the World Health Organization Pain Ladder and briefly cover special cases, including patients receiving analgesia for chronic pain issues who undergo an operation. With the exception of only the simplest and most pain-free of operations, for example, the insertion of grommets, regular analgesia is recommended. There are multiple reasons for this. These include the fact that all painkillers have a delayed onset of action. If a patient waits until they're sore to request a painkiller, it's already too late. From a practical point of view, it is easier for our nursing colleagues on understaffed wards to administer all the painkillers during their set drug rounds than it is for them to constantly try and keep up with periodic requests from patients. However, so-called breakthrough analgesia is important. It may be that your patient has missed or refused a painkiller during the day, but requires something later on. It could be that they experience significant pain in the absence of drug rounds between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. If they are a day case, and depending on the timings of their surgery, they may require analgesia at a more unpredictable time. For all of these reasons, the prescription of additional analgesia in the as-required section of the drug cardex is important. When prescribing any painkiller, you need to consider a variety of factors in addition to the perceived severity of the pain. These include the most suitable route. Has the patient had major colonic surgery and isn't able to absorb oral medications? Is it appropriate to give an oral medication, which will take at least 30 minutes to work, to a patient in severe pain? In patients with known blood-borne infections, such as hepatitis C, is it responsible to ask the nursing staff to frequently expose himself to needle stick injuries by prescribing intramuscular analgesia? Some practitioners would argue that the intramuscular route for analgesia is never appropriate, and that the subcutaneous route is far kinder to the patient whilst being equally as effective. Again, nursing factors are an issue. In ARI, the prescription of oral morphine solution rather than oral morphine tablets has been granted exemption from the requirement of two qualified nurses to administer a control drug. This makes it the strong oral opiate of choice in our centre and makes it far more likely that patients receive their analgesia in a timely manner. Here is the World Health Organization Pain Ladder. It suggests a stepwise approach to pain management, starting with the simple at step one and migrating up to strong opiates at step three. However, it emphasizes that the simple analgesia not be discontinued, but that these are built upon in the subsequent steps. We'll examine each step briefly and discuss some relevant points on each. The first step typically involves paracetamol and a non-steroidal. Hopefully, you're all familiar with the majority of these. We'll highlight that different non-steroidals have different potential routes for administration. Ketorolac is less commonly used, but is ideal for administering in patients for whom the enteral route is compromised. Gabapentin or amitriptyline are more typically seen used in the treatment of neuropathic pain, but you may see them prescribed for post-operative patients as an additional adjuvant for their opiate-sparing effects. Other non-pharmacological adjuvants are unlikely to be relevant in the post-operative setting, but shouldn't be forgotten about in general pain management. For instance, the application of a hot pack to someone experiencing back pain. These drugs are generally safe, but there are some specific issues worth highlighting. Always be aware of patients who may be less than 50 kilos and prescribe a reduced dose of paracetamol. The association between non-steroidals and GI bleeding and irritation is well known. Less well known is this is not a direct effect. The ibuprofen tablet doesn't physically burn a hole in your stomach. And as such, IV ketorolac is just as, if not more dangerous, than other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in vulnerable patients. Please take extra care when prescribing regular non-steroidals for patients who will be nil by mouth for prolonged periods. They are also implicated in precipitating renal failure, especially in patients already at risk, such as those taking other nephrotoxic medications and the hypovolemic. Despite these issues, though, they are very potent painkillers and should be used whenever safe. Next, we'll look at step two. This is for patients in whom step one has failed to manage their pain and sees the addition of a weak opioid to the previous described analgesics. Dihydrocodeine is a weak opiate, but produces adequate analgesia in many patients in many circumstances. It's often well tolerated, but is notorious for causing constipation. There is some controversy regarding its metabolism to dihydromorphine being essential to its activity. However, there's little evidence that this is a clinical effect. Tramadol is more complicated than being a simple opiate and has some extra effect via actions on noradrenaline and serotonin receptors and release. As such, it's recommended that it be avoided in patients concurrently receiving a serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor or a selective noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. 
In more chronic pain use, a modified release preparation exists and that can be taken once or twice a day. In the acute setting, these drugs are typically given four times a day with additional breakthrough doses prescribed. Both of these drugs are poor analgesics when given alone, but are much more beneficial when given in combination with paracetamol. And they should always be used in the context of the WHO ladder, therefore, along with paracetamol. Finally, we move to step three for those patients who are still sore. Classically, this requires the cessation of the weak opioid in favour of a stronger one, but it should be noted that for post-operative pain, it is not uncommon to prescribe regular paracetamol and regular dihydrocodine, but with oral morphine solution as breakthrough. This does not neatly fit into the ladder. It should simply be understood that it is pointless to give both a regular weak opioid and a regular strong opioid. Just use one or the other. Commonly used strong opioids include morphine, oxycodone, hydromorphone and fentanyl. Each has a variety of trade names. For example, oxycodone has two different marketed preparations known as oxycontin and oxynorm and can be given in a variety of different ways. They differ in terms of potency and certain pharmacodynamic variations, which we'll discuss shortly. However, all opiates have the same broad side effects and issues. They can cause profound respiratory depression and excessive doses. They are very constipating, and anyone receiving more than a few doses should be prescribed a concurrent laxative. As an FI1, you'd be disappointed to learn there is no standard dose for the majority of opiates. It's influenced by patient size, weight, age, previous opiate use and exposure, and the severity of their pain. Reassessment of the patient's pain following initial dosing is therefore extremely important, and titration to effect is crucial. The exception to this is in patient-controlled analgesia devices, which are all set at a standard rate and dose. PCAs are hugely beneficial for a lot of patients and allow them to control their own analgesia. However, they have their own issues. Being attached to a pump reduces mobility, falling asleep means no further drug administration and the patient can then wake up sore, pumps can occlude or alarm, and the patient needs to understand the purpose of the button as well as being physically strong enough to press it. We have highlighted a few important considerations for the different opiates. Morphine is still the most commonly used in Aberdeen. Be aware that the oral dose does not directly equate to the intravenous doses, with only around a third of the oral dose reaching systemic circulation. Morphine should be used in caution with those with renal impairment, as it has active metabolites that accumulate. And if used in these patients, the time between doses should be longer. Oxycodone is said to be about twice as strong as morphine, and has potentially fewer side effects, such as itching, nausea, and pseudo-hallucinations. However, it is more expensive. It exhibits slightly less first-pass metabolism, but the enteral and parenteral doses are still different. Hydromorphone is commonly used in those with renal impairment. However, the dosing is complicated and it is expensive as well, so it's not routinely used. Fentanyl is less commonly used in post-operative pain due to its shorter half-life following a bolus dose. However, it is occasionally used in PCAs in patients who become too drowsy with morphine. This reduced sedative effect is beneficial in such cases. However, the ability to administer frequent doses with minimal drowsiness can lead to greater problems with respiratory depression. Thanks to fentanyl's high lipid solubility, it can also be used as a transdermal patch. This is rarely used in the acute setting, but is more common in chronic pain conditions. Each postoperative patient should have their analgesia requirements reviewed daily and an attempt at step-down analgesia made when able. This would typically involve changing the PCA to a regular weak opiate with breakthrough strong opiate. The PCA chart can be a guide to the patient's daily opiate requirement and this can allow the prescription of an adequate alternative and dose required. Stopping the PCA allows an improvement in the patient's mobility and all the advantages associated with that. Finally, we will briefly mention patients who present preoperatively on significant amounts of painkillers. These patients should have these continued as far as able and be prescribed additional analgesia postoperatively. For instance, someone on long-acting morphine tablets should continue to take these in the background and have a PCA if they're needed. If you cannot continue their preoperative medication for whatever reason, then you must attempt to replace this via a different route in addition to normal postoperative analgesia. Such patients can be very difficult to manage, and senior or specialist advice in the form of the acute pain team may very well be needed. But don't forget the simple things, or your pain ladder. Make sure they get regular paracetamol if they can get it. Neuropathic pain is becoming increasingly recognised as a far more common component of acute pain 
both post-operative pain and pain following trauma or inflammatory processes. Neuropathic pain is far less responsive to opiate or conventional analgesia than normal nociceptive pain. It is important to have a high index of suspicion and recognize when neuropathic pain might be present and institute appropriate specific therapy for neuropathic pain, such as gabapentinoids or amitriptyline. Get specialist acute pain team help. Pain management in patients who are habituated to opiates, either legitimately or otherwise, can be particularly challenging. The provision or continuation of background administration of opiates is usually necessary, although the precise approach taken and dosing can be difficult. Get help from the acute pain service. A great many post-operative patients are fluid depleted to a greater or lesser extent, and some patients will also have other renal risk factors such as sepsis or nephrotoxic drugs. Care should be taken when prescribing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in these circumstances. It's not a good reason to avoid the use of non-steroidals in these post-operative pain management, but rather to apply good medical care and assess the risk in individual patients. Dehydrated patients can be easily assessed and treated with fluids.